so so much for joining us for our uh, Rare Disease Day celebration. I'm Durham Wong Rieger and President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. And this is the first time in many years that we've not actually been able to have a live uh, uh, meeting together. Um, in previous years, we would be standing together probably at Queen's Park having uh, some bacon and eggs and some bagels there and uh, drinking fairly tepid coffee and, and really being able to celebrate in person. However, we are thrilled that you are able to join us and we're going to get right into it. This is a really important occasion for us in terms of rare disease. And so we really want to take the opportunity to celebrate how far we've come in a very, uh, probably a very short period of time for Canada, a long period of time in terms of the history of rare diseases. But I think we're also recognizing we're at pretty much what I would call, again, a real turning point in terms of where we want to be with rare diseases coming up. We've got, um, this morning we will have an introduction from um, our keynote uh, uh, speaker welcoming us to Rare Disease Day. I'm really thrilled about that. You have a panel that's going to talk about what are some of the advances that are being made in terms of rare disease and the rare disease strategy here in Canada. And then a very special panel of patient-patient representatives who are going to be talking to us about some of the changes that they're experiencing and introducing a couple really important concepts for us. One you will hear about is the launch of, for the first time, a Cord Rare Heroes Foundation. And this will be a foundation that is hopefully going to be able to provide support to patients and patient organizations, something as a national alliance we've never been able to do, but thanks to a legacy donation and also thanks to our first corporate partner in this foundation, Illumina, we're happy to be able to announce that we will be setting this up, details to follow, also with a fundraising campaign that will be attached to it, to at least one initial fundraising activity, so we're really excited about that. This is a game. I just also want to remind you that we do have a light up uh, monument um, a, a campaign that has been taking place and we know some of you have been successful in getting that done in honor of Rare Diseases Day. So we would like to really uh, recognize um, the ones that we do know about, BC Place Stadium and Olympic Cauldron, uh, obviously Vancouver, the Calgary Tower, the Toronto CN Tower, and the Edmonton High Level Bridge. If there are others that you have been able to get, we really encourage you to put it in your social media and copy at Rare Disorders with your photos of the monuments and we'll make sure that information gets spread. It's such an important way of being able to raise awareness around rare diseases and certainly again as a celebration of rare diseases. So thank you all of you who've been able to help make that happen. So without much further ado, I'm going to actually invite our our keynote speaker and our welcome to welcome us. Um, we're really thrilled to have Member of Parliament Francis Duane uh, here with us. Uh, Francis Duane is the Liberal Member of Parliament from Lynn Gary Prescott Russell in Eastern Ontario, and he's been the member since 2015. Very importantly, in 2016, he founded and now serves as chair of the Amyotrophic uh, Lateral Sclerosis ALS Caucus in the House of Commons, in part to honor his former caucus colleague and certainly a friend of all of us, Miro Belanger, who passed away from ALS that same year. That was, in fact, the same year that we were able to launch the rare disease strategy. So without much further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, MP uh, uh, Joanne to give us some words of welcome. He'd do that a whole lot better if he unmuted. I just needed permission. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to uh, to speak with you um, virtually. And before I I, I start uh, my my short presentation, I I do want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the unceded traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin. C'est pour moi un honneur aujourd'hui de prendre part la parole devant vous lors de cette rencontre en lien avec la journée pour les maladies rares. As um, your CEO mentioned, I am Francis Drouin, Member of Parliament and co-chair of the ALS Caucus. I started off as being the chair, but now I'm glad to see that this is a, a multi-party caucus. And uh, my friend Todd Doherty from the Conservative and my other friend Heather McPherson, who is also a, an NDP member from Edmonton, are co-chairing with me. As you know, one in 12 Canadians have a rare disorder. Approximately 3 million Canadians and their families face a debilitating disease that severely impacts their lives. Rare diseases are a scourge that year after year, 
for many Canadians are a synonym for pain and in many cases, tragic. On this rare disease day, I can't help myself for having a special thought for my friend, Maurice Belanger, who passed away in 2016 from ALS. But since becoming chair, I have met many Canadians diagnosed with ALS, whom I would call friends. Some of them are still with me today, but unfortunately, some of them are no, are no longer with me. And today I'm thinking of Eddie Lefrancois and more recently, Carol Skinner. While I'm saddened for their loss, I continue to be inspired by their selflessness to give to their broader community to make progress on this terminal disease. I also draw my inspiration on a young man who was a constituent of mine. Many of you heard of him, Jonathan Pitre, who had a rare skin disease. He passed away at the young age of 17, but his selfless spirit to, continues to inspire many in our community. These people are heroes. On this day, as the theme of today's conference is celebrating achievement that support a pan-Canadian rare drug program, I remember the famous quote by St. Francis of Assisi, where there is hatred, let me sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is discord, union, where there is doubt, fate, where there is despair, hope, and where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. And joyful we should be, as we now more know than ever, Canadians are aware of the hardship that represents rare diseases. Now more than ever, advocacy is at its highest level. And now more than ever, there is true political will. And I would say political will because of you on all fronts to change the system and improve the lives of Canadians that suffer from these diseases. I believe that now's the time to act to provide a better future for Canadians with rare diseases in terms of access to treatments to Canadians and their families who are impacted by a rare disease, but also in terms of drugs and treatment pricing. Right now, the approach to rare diseases is far from being optimal. It is fragmented across the country, and this means Canadian families with rare illnesses are facing extraordinary and unique challenges, and sometimes, and most of the times, can feel lonely because of this. These include misdiagnosis, unnecessary, unnecessary surgery, social isolation, financial hardship, lack of treatment options, and early death. Aucun Canadien ne devrait avoir à choisir entre payer les médicaments sur ordonnance dont ils ont besoin ou se nourrir simplement parce qu'ils ne peuvent pas se permettre de tout payer. Toutefois, chaque année, un million de Canadiens se passent d'aliments et de chauffage afin de pouvoir acheter leurs médicaments. Les prix payés par les Canadiens pour les médicaments sur ordonnance sont parmi les plus élevés au monde. Les médicaments de marque coûtent en moyenne 20 de plus au Canada que dans l'autre économie avancée. Par conséquent, certaines familles ont de la difficulté à payer des médicaments sur ordonnance. As you know, to help Canadians with rare diseases get better access to effective treatment, last year we proposed to invest up to $1 billion over two years starting in 22-23, with up to $500 million per year ongoing for making high drug for rare diseases more accessible. And I know a panel will be addressing this question. And I don't know if I'll be able to watch it all, but I do certainly look forward to the uh, comments that would be made today uh, on this particular matter. This will positively impact the lives of thousands of our friends, family members, and Canadians in general. As Canada considers how best to create a national strategy on high cost drugs for rare diseases, it is important that Canadians, especially patients, their families, and their caregivers have a voice in helping to shape it. So we invite all Canadians to share their ideas and views on what a national strategy could look like. By participating, views and ideas will be in a position to create not only the best national strategy, but a national strategy that represents your needs best. En tant que président du caucus contre la SLA, je sais à quel point Le coût exorbitant des médicaments pour les maladies rares peut représenter un obstacle pour bien des Canadiens. Trop souvent, ces traitements, tant nécessaires, ne sont pas couverts par les régimes d'assurance provinciaux et trop souvent, ils doivent être payés de la poche des patients. Preliminary meetings at the official levels have commenced with various stakeholders and provinces to understand their perspective on aspects of the national strategy. The timeline for implementations are ambitious, but through deliberate and focused collaboration with the provinces, our strategy will be launched as planned in 2022. 
Right now, only 60% of treatments for rare disorders make it to Canada, and most get approved up to six years later than in the United States and Europe. That's simply unacceptable. I understand Canada is a small market relatively to the size of the US and Europe, but that's why I believe we must create an ecosystem that is attractive for a research community, that promotes collaboration not only within Canada, but around the world, and provides a clear path to market for treatment options. Our fight against rare diseases and disorder is far from over, but we are on a path moving forward to the good of, for thousands of Canadians that today suffering are suffering from rare diseases. And I do wanna thank this moment to um, acknowledge and thank the doctors, the scientists, the researchers, and the young grads that are choosing a career path towards eradicating these rare diseases. I wanna thank the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders and its networks. And finally, I want to thank the patient community and their family. Without patient perspective, and I've certainly learned this over the few years I've been um, co-chairing the ALS caucus, patient perspective is extremely important. So I wanna say thank you for raising the profile on these rare disorders. You have allies, allies and you've built allies amongst the House of Commons of Canada. And we'll continue to push until we get a strategy in place in order to provide the treatment options for families who need it. Good luck today on this webinar. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Drouin. Um, my name is Bill Dempster, a longtime contributor to CORD programs, policy and advocacy. And we're just, and I'm just thrilled to, to be here to help celebrate Rare Disease Day. A, um, Monsieur Drouin, uh, vous êtes uh, toujours là, mais uh, pour un petit bout, bout uh, peut-être, vous nous avez montré comment nos représentants politiques peuvent engager avec la communauté rare partout au Canada pour le bien-être des patients et leurs proches. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and, and that of your government on how we can move forward to, to do better by uh, some of the most vulnerable um, in Canada. Uh, I'm here to actually introduce the next panel, but I'm going to do that in more detail, um, actually, uh, on the panel that was pre-recorded a couple of days ago. Um, I learned so much uh, about what has happened in key areas of research and, and health system change and I think you will too. So um, Angela, can you please uh, queue up that uh, next panel and then uh, I, I'll probably be back on in just a little while. Um, please feel free to uh, take part in the chat, uh, chat group of, of, the, of today's webinar as well. Welcome back everyone um, to the second part of our Rare Disease Day uh, celebration. And it is indeed a celebration. This is um, a very different form than we normally have. And um, I think we've just had an amazing panel in which you've had some of the researchers, clinicians, um, and, and patient advocates talking about the importance of a rare disease strategy in Canada. Now we're going to actually go to some people who are going to give us some different perspectives in terms of rare diseases, how it's affected their lives, but more importantly, how they and their family are contributing to rare diseases and also contributing to our organization. Welcome back, everyone. Technical difficulty. Um... We should be getting that up very shortly. Uh, I know this never happens, right? Um, I can confirm that uh, in the meantime, I am not a cat um, and that Angela is going to have it. Here we go. Welcome back right. everyone um, to the second part of our Rare Disease Day uh, celebration. And it is indeed a celebration. This is um, a very different form than we normally have. And um, I think we've just had an amazing panel in which you've had some of the researchers, clinicians, um, and, and patient advocates talking about the importance of a rare disease strategy in Canada. Now we're going to actually go to some people who are going to give us some different perspectives in terms of rare diseases, how it's affected their lives, but more importantly, how they and their family are contributing to rare diseases and also contributing to our 
organization, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. So I've got three amazing, amazing people here um, who up until this evening, this afternoon, actually uh, had never met each other. But I think they'll recognize that there's a real cord that runs uh, 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 between them, really connected. So we're going to try one more time to get that video going. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, and while we're waiting to get that up, I, I just have to say that was probably the first time I've heard, um, you know, uh, a political speech like that quote from Saint Francois d'Assise. I thought that was really um, touching. I mean, I grew up in, in you know, um, in that. Uh, culture and background and it was um that was very uh very heartfelt and thoughtful so um once again uh thank you uh, monsieur Drouin, for uh, for bringing that forward that was that was beautiful okay welcome back thank everyone um Thank you everyone for joining uh, CORD, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders on International Rare Disease Day. Um, we've already started the webinar. So uh, um, this is, uh, this is the, the panel that you've all been waiting for. Um, we're here to, to look at back at what happened in 2015 and why that was optimal, uh, a seminal year for, for rare diseases in Canada and what have we accomplished. The Canadian Organization for Rare Diseases launched Canada's rare disease strategy in 2015, took it across the country. This was the result of thousands of hours of input and work from across all sectors of the community. And this includes governments, researchers, clinicians, caregivers, industry, and it was led and coordinated by, by patients. One of the reasons why it came to be was that governments were not moving forward and Durhan, uh, saw and was part of these global efforts around the world, saw national rare disease strategies come forward from South America, across Europe and Asia. And we, were, we weren't gonna wait for it any longer. So, so CORD launched Canada's rare disease strategy and it called for action in five key areas with very specific next steps. There were 20 next steps in total. And the five areas were diagnosis and prevention, expert care and treatment, community support, access to therapies, and research. So for Rare Disease Day 2021 today, CORD is going to raise awareness of the progress and achievements in each of these areas and potentially highlight a couple of the issues that we still have to work on because it's far from being completely implemented. So today a panel of experts will discuss where we've come from, what's been accomplished, where we're going both here in Canada and through international collaborations on behalf of the rare disease community because this is international Rare Disease Day. And we have come a long way. I'm just going to highlight a couple of the tops of the trees, and I'm sure we're going to go into, into these in a bit more detail. Rare diseases is at the top of the health agenda for the federal government and in several provinces. We know that for a fact in Ontario, the health minister wants to move forward. It's very important in Quebec. And of course, we've got um, Health Canada's focus both at the regulatory level and as I mentioned, uh, as, as we'll talk about, um, the, the budget uh, uh, promise of half a billion dollars per year starting in 2022. We know Genome Canada and other research networks across the country are doing things today that, that they just wouldn't have been possible five years ago. We know that health technology assessments are different today in Canada than, than they ever have been. Uh, they're looking at data differently. Um, Ines in Quebec is, is, is uh, considering the promise of value, not just what we see today, but they know that this is a, they're not looking at, at data the same way that they were, where they were much more strict um, just a few years ago. Um, and more recently, there's been a huge consultation, and CORD's been at the front of that, on a national rare disease drug strategy um, that we're probably going to talk a bit more about. But today, we're going to celebrate rare disease strategy with you by inviting some of the champions for rare disorders in Canada to take stock of what they've seen and what they've been a part of and what are some of the challenges that we still need to overcome? So introducing the panel, we've got uh, Dr. Cindy Bell with Genome Canada, where she is Executive Vice President of Corporate Development. 
and Cindy is focused on securing and nurturing genomics research across the country. We've got Dr. Leanne Ward with uh, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Among many other things that, uh, that, that Leanne leads on, she's the medical director of the Bone Health Clinic here at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa. We've got Dr. Craig Campbell in, in London, Ontario. Uh, similar to, to Dr. Ward, um, many different things that you're involved with, Craig, but among other things, you're head of pediatric ne neurology. And Tammy Moore, uh, the CEO of ALS Canada. And um, I had a, you know, one of the most incredible um, patient representatives, patient group representatives, and I saw you at the health committee, bringing the health committee through, imagining being somebody with ALS, and my, my heart stopped when I saw you actually explain what that was like. So that's incredible that you were able to represent um, that feeling in that kind of um, environment. And Dr. Durhan Wang Rieger, of course, is the president and CEO of CORD. Um, we're going to, and it's great to have you as a panelist, uh, uh, Durhan. Um, we've got a, a set of questions for everybody, uh, and we're going to start with, with a double-barreled one. Don't take too much time if you can, because I want this to turn into a conversation where people can put your hand up and, and ask questions um, from among each other. But first, I'd like each of you to briefly describe your role in, in Canada's rare disease landscape. And second, thinking back over the last five or ten years, what has been the most impactful change in your area of rare disease uh, involvement in Canada? So what, what's been the, the biggest thing that you've seen in the last five or 10 years? So maybe we'll start with, with Cindy. Do you want to kick it off from, from uh, Genome Canada? Sure. Th thank you very much, uh, Bill. And I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So for over 20 years, basically since its inception, Genome Canada has been at the forefront of advancing through its research investments, communications, and its partnerships, our understanding of the molecular basis of rare diseases and improved diagnostics, and both of which are critical for informing the development of improved targeted treatment for rare disease patients through genomics. Um, we are part of, a, of a, an ecosystem across the country that um, actively convenes, facilitates, and, and really is building a foundation for Precision Health in Canada. And I would say, you know, thinking back over the past five to 10 years, um, our ability to do genome sequencing, the, the, the ability because of the decreased costs and, and the way it has advanced, as well as the advances on data sharing, have really enhanced our ability to um, actively engage in rare disease research. And um, more recently, we've launched our All for One Precision Health Initiative with the goal of advancing genomics into the clinic. And the first phase of this initiative is focused on rare disease, building on the strong research network that we have supported in partnership with the six regional genome centers and CIHR um, across the country. And the goal of it is really to ensure that every Canadian with a serious genetic condition has access to a timely and accurate genomic-based diagnosis. And so we, we believe um, the technical advances, the data sharing advances really facilitated our ability to advance this initiative. Thanks so much, Cindy. Um, Leanne, do you want to uh, talk about what, what you've seen in your area and, and, and wh where the accomplishments, accomplishments have been uh, in the last five or 10 years? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be part of this panel and to share my perspective. I'll first just tell you that the way in which I've been involved with rare diseases is that I've been a clinical trial site enrolling patients in the therapeutic trials. I've been an advisor to industry on the design of their therapeutic trials, and I've also run my own studies and I've been on data safety monitoring boards. I'm also involved in some uh, central imaging analyses on the bone side for international trials studying rare diseases. So I've been able to look at the rare disease space from a number of different angles, including taking care of the patients themselves. I think over the last five to 10 years, what I've witnessed as the biggest changes that have been impactful have been the explosion in our understanding of the genetic basis, just like Cindy said, and the tremendous interest that's come from that in understanding the pathobiology of rare disease, and that in turn can lead to therapeutic targets. So there's a lot of interest now in therapeutic drug development to get 
the heart of the pathobiology uh, of these conditions. I think the other thing that I've come to appreciate is the extent to which patients are willing to collaborate on rare disease trials and also just rare disease care partnerships. Patients will go to tremendous lengths to help themselves understand themselves, but also their family members and the greater community. So I think that's been very uh, learning uh, on in terms of my engagement in this space. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Craig, over to you. Let's go to London. Yeah, Th thanks. thanks so much for, for having me. Um, you know, I'm a pediatric neurologist and I, I primarily do neuromuscular care. So, um, you know, probably my first and foremost um, journey in rare disease is, you know, is the daily journey with, with the families, the patients who are, you, you know, it, the, the incredible strength and resiliency of, you know, a lot of these families uh, who are journeying with their, with their kids, uh, you know, through, through um, rare disease and encountering the medical system. So, of course, that's, you know, was, was sort of my entry point. But, um, uh, you know, over the years, I've been involved in really trying to wrap, um, you know, the community, uh, the neuromuscular community into structures and organizations that will help us, uh, you know, as a community find solutions for rare disease. So, you know, it's it's critically important in these, um, you know, small communities of, of patients and, and uh, caregivers and physicians, partners and healthcare providers that we come together uh, to, to organize ourselves into groups that can uh, build clinical trial capacity as, you know, as Leanne's talked about across the country, provide people the opportunity to be be involved in um, in clinical trials for rare disease, and then building structures like um, you know registries, rare disease registries, where you know we can actually contribute and and collect and collate um, high quality. Uh, data that uh, that can help inform us not only for clinical trial planning, you know, but then um, uh, if there's successes, uh, you know, for post marketing surveillance, um, and and really all these things that I've spent my career working on, uh, you know, we were we were uh, thrilled to see an action as uh, we you know we realized uh, a treatment or multiple treatments for for spinal muscular atrophy. So if I think back on you know how we were impactful. I think we certainly in Canada, we helped move that that along uh, in a way that was positive for many, many people. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Craig. And Tammy. Thank you, uh, Bill. And thank you, Jerhan, for having me here today. And I think, Bill, what you were referencing when I was before the Standing Committee on Health is very much trying to bring the experience of people who are actively living with ALS. And so what I challenged the committee to do was to sit still and for the remainder of my remarks to not move because that would be what it would be like to be living with ALS as the disease has progressed. And so it's in that that we bring the color of the patient community, the 2000 Canadians who are currently living with ALS. At ALS Canada, we're responsible for the National Research Program in Canada. And when I think about the rare disease strategy and some of the things that are Durhan and the group had brought forward previously, I think about some of the investments that we've made as ALS Canada to help build that infrastructure across Canada to support the Canadian ALS research community as well as clinician. I think about the investments that we've made in that way. When we also have a responsibility um, as well for advocacy, and that's probably as you're asking about what's the biggest change in the last five to 10 years, it is in advocacy because we've seen the, the second therapy in 20 years to come forward to Health Canada for approval. And then two years post-Health Canada approval before it was in the hands of Canadians. And so while many people in the rare disease community, and I understand, look at the fact that many of their therapies have faced far longer, two and a half years means that we have lost over two and a half thousand Canadians in that time, and that's just not acceptable. And so advocacy uh, on access to therapies has become a much more significant area. And I think an area where I've seen much more work around coalitions and work collaboratively to bring it forward. And we are actively working with people living with ALS within Ontario, helping them to provide the very supports from the day that somebody receives a diagnosis in clinic, our regional manager will help be there to help them navigate their journey with the disease 
and then providing practical things like assistive devices. So we're seeing at all levels um, in terms of the work that we do and we have international collaborations and interactions as well that also contribute. Thanks so much, Tammy. And Durhan, this is kind of funny. You're gonna have a hard, um, hard decision to make in terms of where do you start in, over the last five to 10 years <laughs> in terms of, of what's happened, but, but go for it. Dead easy for me. What's really changed is this panel. And what five, 10 years ago, we could not have had this panel with the kind of depth behind it. I think the other thing that I'm really, really excited about is I say we're the only developed country that doesn't have an official rare disease national plan, but we are the only country where we actually develop a strategy and we've put it out there and we've got people and institutions to actually buy into it and make the kind of advances that we're making without necessarily asking and having the government actually sanction and actually then help to fund a national plan, national strategy. So maybe that's just the Canadian way. You know, we know how to bootstrap. We know how to take advantage of the local resources. We know how to do what we need to do without necessarily having a whole bunch that's actually handed to us. I mean, I look at what Craig does, I look at what Leanne does. I know what Cindy, we've said on many of the committees, people are there as volunteers. They're doing it on their own time. They're taking the, you know, you know, in the evenings. And then we know what Tammy, you know, your community, right? People are coming forth on their own. So I'm really proud of the fact that we've actually been able to help create a vehicle, but I'm more proud of the fact that you know, in Canada, so many people have actually been able to move forward rare diseases, you know, in a way that um, certainly um, has advanced the whole community. What we really need to do is to make sure we can integrate it, stitch it together, and that we do have that comprehensive integrated whole. So that to me, when we get to the forward question, that's it. But I'm truly proud looking at this panel and recognizing not only what they're doing, what they're doing on their own, but all the many people behind them that they're bringing along. This is an amazing community here in Canada. Anyone want to jump in on on the strategy itself? And, and just to, to recap again, it, you know, the, the, the five pillars, diagnosis, diagnosis and prevention, expert care and treatment, community support, access to therapies and research. And just a little bit more background on it. Uh, a lot of the, 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 the concept of the strategy was was building on or inspired by what, what happened in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is a federal model. So you can't have one strategy for all four countries in the kingdom. You needed a framework. And that that reminded court of Canada because we have provinces. And I, I mean, Cindy, you live this every day as a sort of like a pan-Canadian organization that's constantly trying to, you know, figure this out and navigate Canada where Quebec is not the same as British Columbia. I don't know if you want to comment on, on how you've managed to do that and, 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 and what does that mean for the rare disease, disease strategy? Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, your reference to the UK, they really are a model for us in so many areas. We often forget they do represent both countries, so they do face many of the same challenges. And uh, we, we talk to them a lot, learn from them. And, you know, I would love to see us have what they have as to talk about a real national plan, national strategy that has the buy-in, you know, across the government. And, and so because of the landscape in Canada and our author one program is, is an example of that, you know, we have to work in each province. So we have these six sites across the country where we're doing, we're calling them clinical implementation sites. And they are being driven by ministries, potential health authorities. And so we're meeting the needs, knowing that each of the projects, each of the sites is going to be very different, but they will be doing what's needed for their province. And then the plan is to put them all together through a Canadian data ecosystem that will allow them to share data. So it's really working with the different jurisdictions, identifying what they need, providing the motivation for them to participate with us, and then stepping back and letting them do it. And being led by amazing clinician scientists across the country. Bill, can I just add here? I mean, it's it's um, uh, it's it's never more evident the you know how how these structures do not flow with the disease communities, right? I mean, when you're when you're really in that struggle together to to get a drug, you know, through the the provincial. Um, um, 
uh, the pan canadian pharmaceutical process and your deal and these families many of them these communities are so small they know each other the physicians know each other we're all ready to work together as a community to try and overcome you know some of these these obstacles and to you know to see the barrier the what i see as you know kind of artificial barriers set up just across board provincial borders is incredibly frustrating we have to um, really approach this in my mind as disease communities, not as provinces. That's what it reminds me a bit of um, the early days of HIV and even some of the, um, uh, the other disease areas where the provincial governments actually built a separate program around that disease area and it was soup to nuts. They were going to figure this out and help those patients. But that was 20 years ago. Now we've got all of these different layers of bureaucracy, and it's as if they have to hand a widget down sequentially. Um, I don't know, Tammy, do you want to comment a little bit on, on what Craig said? Because you, you want to make some difference here too. Where would you start on that? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think if we look at some of the experiences now that we can from even COVID and the vaccinations, we can see that there's a different way to do it. And so what can we learn from this experience that we can take forward? Because exactly to your point, we, uh, talk about federal aspects, but once it gets into the provinces, we run up against these barriers. And our fear now for our community is that, yes, we've got the second therapy, but what's going to happen on the third and the fourth and the fifth therapy, which are so closely coming behind it? And how can we make sure that Canadians are ultimately going to have access? And just picking up on something that Jerhan had said as well, you know, I think in the absence of a federal strategy, we've actually, as organizations, and communities had to build these things anyways. And I would take the opportunity to say, you know, ALS is a larger disease. We've had a bit more to be able to make some of those investments, but not all, the, not all diseases have that. And by no means in the ALS community is it everything it should be. I look at some of the investments we have made to be able to build and foster and support clinical uh, research um, capacity across the country through our investments with whole genome sequencing through the um, Project MINE or what we're doing now with Capture ALS, which is also helping to build on that, the neuroimaging that we've helped. But that's in the absence of a federal strategy that could really address some of these significant needs and, and areas. Leanne, I don't know if you want to jump into, does what Tammy and Craig and, and Durhan said and Cindy resonate with what, what, what your experience is? I, yes, absolutely. You know, I think when I um, think about the patient journey, one of the things that for me is is most striking and ties into what Craig and Tammy are, sa are saying is the need for uh, touch points, places that these patients can go and get that comprehensive care that starts with the correct diagnosis and moves into the development of a therapeutic plan. And just in my experience, working with a clinician and a care team that understands the disease, you see the, the stress level fall just knowing there's someone there to partner with them. And then you kind of grow from there and you decide for each patient individually what their needs are. And to do that, you have to reach out to so many different um, professionals in, in the care team. I would like to see that need built upon by building centers of excellence across the country where patients know if I have that disease, I can go here. Ideally, they wouldn't have to travel too far, but um, at least, you know, something can hook in and feel like someone's on their walk and on their journey as we grow together because we are moving forward in different ways and we want to collaborate with our patients as far as possible. And maybe I'll turn it back to Durhan to, to comment on that. Thanks, Leanne. Because one of the themes of, of International Rare Disease, Disease Day this year is the many colors of rare. Like, as you were, I think you were saying, Tammy, ALS is not, um, you know, the inherited bone disorders that you deal with, Leanne, or the SMA that Craig has. There are some commonalities. And, and Durhan, you started with the strength of the panel coming together as one of the real achievements. But... Um, what do you think about what Leanne said in terms of centers of excellence that would be disease focused and help bring that patient along 
Well, obviously having centers of excellence that are networked and being able to also be networked to the GPs and the pediatricians, you know, right across the country, right? I mean, that's what the Europeans have. So there are European reference networks. And the sad story, I mean, Cindy knows as well, is that Europeans across 25, 26 different countries are better integrated through their centers of, you know, of uh, reference networks through the um, international research collaborations uh, through their data sharing than we are here, you know, across, you know, 13, you know, uh, provinces and territories. So I think that's a real failing. And I think it's Craig and Leanne and, and Cindy have well demonstrated that bringing these services and getting them together, despite the fact that there isn't an infrastructure that does it. And quite frankly, it means then that everybody's reinventing, reinventing the wheel. You know, what is, we, how should we be networked? What are the kinds of fundamentals around it? What is an infrastructure should there be? And again, we don't have that. And I think Tammy knows that as well, you know, with the disease group. I mean, you know, she's got disease groups that have enough to have chapters, but, and some of them do and some of them don't. But the question again is how should we best work together? And again, each group is struggling trying to figure this out. So we do need to have it. Yes, we're doing well. And I'm really proud of how well we do, but it would be so different. I mean, this is why, and I'll segue into my advertisement, as you know, Bill, why we're saying, you know, having a billion dollars to set up, you know, a rare disease drug strategy means nothing if we do not invest in a rare disease strategy. All the things that people are talking about now. I mean, Craig, you know that well with uh, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. We have newborn screening. Guess what? It's available in Ontario. And we've picked up a couple of children through that. But guess what? If those children had been born in Alberta, to be born in Quebec, to be born in BC, they would not have gotten diagnosed. I mean, that's really sad. And that's not true, you know, for SMAs for many other conditions as well, including some of the genetic conditions. If, in fact, that child needs access to therapy, I'm just uh, advocating with Craig about a kid that we got. If these children were in Alberta, they might actually be treated. The fact is they're in Ontario, there's a hesitancy on, gee, should we be providing them with early access to therapy? We have no uniform guidelines on this, right? And even though we've got two provinces that say we have the same early access program, they're actually implementing it so very differently. And that's a tragedy uh, in terms of not just the families, but also a tragedy in terms of our being able to provide that kind of excellent care. So absolutely, I think what everybody's saying is that we, we're done amazing with what we've done, but we need to have that infrastructure support. We need to have those kinds of national kind of guidelines. And you know, I keep saying, you know, if, we, if we're going to invest, you know, five hundred million dollars a year, you know, we need to invest it very wisely in developing some of these initiatives. So it's not to pay for drugs. You know, paying for the drug is going to be nothing if we don't have some of the other, you know, really fundamental pieces that everybody's talking about here. So maybe that's, that's the challenge over this, unless Tammy, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, I think that really is about the strategy. It's that holistic approach to it, because ultimately, if we spend the money on the therapies, it's going to be spent very quickly. But how can we look at it, which can actually, if we're building the appropriate infrastructure, it can actually lead to um, therapies that are delivered more efficiently as well. It gets us to a place of precision medicine because we're moving those other pieces along with it. So ultimately, by investing, we're actually doing better in a lot of other ways as well. And I just so. want to say that I'm I'm really glad that that was brought up. That that drug therapy is not the only part of the solution. That patients come to the table with so many different needs, and targeting the disease therapeutically is one aspect, but also their mental health and social determinants of health, those are also extraordinarily important. And I certainly don't want us to go down that path of really just focusing on drug therapy. That's obviously critically important, but we have to look at the whole picture, including the patient, the family, and their broader needs. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So it's not just about spending more money on one area. It's actually having the strategy in place that, that looks at things holistically. Um, and Cindy, having sort of built a pan-Canadian system and, and framework, I mean, what would be your advice to actually accomplish that? It's not just about the money. It's about, it's about the, the strategy and the people and getting everyone on the same page, right? How did you do it? Uh, well, uh, th thanks to Dorona, we were around the table for the 2015 strategy and um, learned, learned a lot. And um, for us, it's, it's basically just tackling it one 
province at a time and working, you know, working from bottom up and uh, with the clinicians who, who have the patients and have the networks and who are strong researchers and who could build on that research network and link to their, their ministries. And, and I think, but all of this, um, you know, everybody has said it and I have to say it as well. We really do need a national strategy and a national plan because the treatments aren't everything. To have an accurate diagnosis in a timely fashion is critical, not only to you know, ensure they do get the right treatment that they need, but uh, as Leanne pointed out, mental health, uh, you know, ensuring families the support that they need as quickly as they can. And just getting that diagnosis can be so important. That would be the important first step. Excellent. Thanks so much. We're, we're running very low on time. Um, I'd maybe invite anyone to give, you know, the last few words, if, if you're welcome to, and then I'm going to turn over to Durhan to, uh, to, to thank the panel. But any, any last thoughts for on International Rare Disease Day? Um, I just like to advocate for the patient voice. Patients know what they need. And I think the most important thing that I've learned as a physician caring for patients with rare bone diseases is to them and to what they have to say and what they need. It's not always necessarily what you expect them to say. And so I would like the patient voice to be a real guiding light to us as we go forward. Bill, can I, I, I think, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Craig. You know, add there, you know, the one thing I think we have to recognize is that every one of the stakeholders who are trying, you know, to move this forward are, are you know, are have the best intentions. Uh, and, and it always um, makes me upset that, uh, you know, as we go through this process right from the start to, to finish, it, it always seems that uh, unfortunately, almost all the parties, patients, regulated physicians are, are, are unhappy paradoxically, even though we're all trying to do the right thing for rare disease. And so I think that's a call that we, you know, that we have to do things differently and we really have to commit to this. And so, you know, I thank organizations like CORD and all the other, you know, patient organizations that are working, um, you know, working uh, to try and move, you know, move things down, down the field. This is really important work. And I, I think we can get there with the, 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 the financial commitment uh, for rare disease is a very exciting possibility for all of us here in Canada. And, and Craig, I think we're, we're maybe going to leave it at that. Um, the good news is if you left it on a high note, on a positive note, on um, optimism, and because this, this panel was meant to celebrate successes, to recognize how far rare disease, um, rare diseases have come in Canada, it's unimaginable we would be here right now if it weren't for the hard work of everyone on this panel and the dozens or hundreds of people behind you and patients, caregivers and others. So Durhan, I don't know if you want the last word uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. I will say on a very positive note, it is the community. It's what Leanne has said. It's what Tammy has said. It's what Cindy has said. It's what Craig has said. It is the community that comes together to push it forward. I will tell you on the other, on the distaff note for national plans for rare diseases, we have now seen countries that have reduced their funding, have dropped their funding. And we have, you know, uh, many programs that, you know, are looking up startled, like, you know, what happened and how do we get going? I think the fact is that we have built a very strong community. And I think no matter what happens, right, we will continue to push forward. The monies will facilitate and help make this all happen and happen together. And maybe some inducements for those who are sitting on the sidelines and say, we don't want to join, but hey, you know, with some incentive, but we're not reliant on it for us to be able to continue to move forward. We are truly, I think, the community. So I couldn't be prouder in terms of what Canada is doing. And I look forward to how I keep saying, you know, we can build that system that's going to be the standard in the world. Um, you know, you know, we kind of know how to do it on nothing. Now, good gosh, what could we do if we actually had a billion dollars? Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, happy International Rare Disease Day. Thank you for celebrating. Welcome back, everyone, um, to the second part of our 
Rare Disease Day uh, celebration. And it is indeed a celebration. This is um, a very different form than we normally have. And um, I think we've just had an amazing panel in which you've had some of the researchers, clinicians, um, and, and patient advocates talking about the importance of a rare disease strategy in Canada. Now we're going to actually go to some people who are going to give us some different perspectives in terms of rare diseases, how it's affected their lives, but more importantly, how they and their family are contributing to rare diseases and also contributing to our organization, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. So I've got three amazing, amazing people here um, who up until this, evening, this afternoon actually uh, had never met each other, but I think they'll recognize that there's a real cord that runs uh, 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 between them, really connecting them. Um, we're gonna start with an introduction to Jordan Jantz, who is a 22 year old young man whom we've known for a number of years. Uh, Jordan um, has been living with cystinosis and um, we first uh, met him when he was a young man advocating for a new treatment. And last year, uh, Jordan became our first recipient of the Jonathan Petrie Youth Rare, Rare Youth Hero Award. So we're just so thrilled that Jordan is able to join us for this rare disease celebration. Second, we will have Rick Ness, who, who as he says, has the, um, the, the honor of being the brother of uh, Peter and Dave Ness, who Pete, um, Peter Ness uh, died recently and left the legacy to court. And we're going to talk a little bit about his life and what it meant to him and why he thought it was important to make this contribution and what he hopes it would do. And certainly hear from Rick as well in terms of his family. And the third speaker will be Aditi Kantapuli, who is um, a medical student at McGill now. Uh, Aditi and I first met actually in India at a, a conference there, which was one of the most ornate events that I've been at in terms of a, of a rare disease conference, amazing. And uh, at the time, talking to me about her medical studies and what she wanted to be able to do, certainly in contributions to rare diseases. And we're gonna talk about an amazing contribution that she's made and how it actually connects back to the other two uh, speakers here. So without much further ado, I'm going to actually turn to Jordan and um, ask uh, Jordan to just introduce himself and maybe just tell us a little bit about, you know, what is your experience like in living with cystinosis? Uh, what have you done to improve your treatment, uh, starting with the first uh, improvement that you made to your treatment? And uh, what have you done recently? And, and how has that actually kind of changed your life a bit? Jordan. Yeah, so I'm Jordan Yance, and um, I was diagnosed with cystinosis at eight months old. Um, I was actually diagnosed through the crystals in my eyes, which is pretty rare. And um, ever since then, I was on um, the old pills. It was Cystagon, and they were every you had to do them every six hours. And I was on them until I was about 12 years old. And then I started to do a trial in Chicago for RP103. Um, it's now known as Sustamine, I believe. And I did a trial in Chicago till I was 18 years old. And then the, they finally got approved in the States and Canada. And then I was on those pills for three years. Um, and then I got accepted into a trial in San Diego. And all the way leading up to that, I always kept my health. My health was um, important to me. I always worked out. I always ate healthy, always did my meds exactly on time. Um, so then I turned 20 years old and we were always watching Dr. Shirky out of San Diego to see when the trial was going to be um, approved. And it finally got FDA approved um, a year and it would have been like two years ago, it got FDA approved. And then a year and four months ago, I did the trial. I was the first person to do it. It was a stem cell treatment trial. Um, they, three months before the treatment, they, I went through apheresis and they took my stem cells from me. Uh, modified it with their own gene um, from, I believe, Dr. Cohen in LA. And then they, I went through chemo, they put the stem cells back in me. And now I'm um, a year post transplant and doing well. So everything is looking good on that, that and um, uh, yeah, is there any other questions? So tell us how your life has changed now that you've had. So Jordan had the um, was a great advocate in bringing in the new therapy, which he under I think um, 
Now, it doesn't really give full credit to the challenge. If you can imagine having a therapy you have to take every six hours, what that means in terms of a child and being woken up in the middle of the night to get a treatment, but also, um, you know, the uh, his strong advocacy to make the drug treatment available. But then um, going in, as he says, getting the first um, ex vivo um, gene therapy, you know, so they put in a functioning gene. So I think uh, you were saying before, you know, you don't even know if you have cystinosis anymore. Yeah, it's it's hard to believe. I don't know if I can say that I have cystinosis or can't say that I have cystinosis. So um, I guess maybe in two years time or three years time, then I can finally say that when they're um, for sure that uh, my body is 100% healthy now. And so far since it's it's been a year and I have crystals in my skin and in my eyes and they've decreased by 75% in a year, which is pretty amazing. And uh, my kidney function has stayed about the same. It's about 50%. But the reason I wanted to do the trial is because eventually I was either going to need a kidney transplant in probably five years time if I didn't do the trial or I do the trial. And the worst that can happen is I go back on my pills. So I thought it's four months out of my life that I'd be living in San Diego. Why not just try it? I could save my life because it's in San Diego and I don't know if it'll get approved in Canada and Canada is where I live. So who knows if it'll ever come to me. So that was my only chance. So I took it and ended up working so far. And um, yeah, I just hope that I don't need a kidney transplant eventually. Great. So I'm going to segue over then to Rick. And uh, I said, it's quite coincidental, actually, Rick's story and Jordan's story. It wasn't planned this way. It had no no actual relationship. But Rick, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your brother, Peter, and what his experience was like with cystinosis and how, you know, he ended up uh, making the kind of contribution that he did. Well, it's um, hearing Jordan's story is heartwarming. Uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, a little emotional about it because um, uh it's it's fantastic um pete pete uh, uh is much older obviously he died at the age of 64. uh when he was diagnosed with cystinosis the way it was diagnosed was he had juvenile cystinosis so it would become much it would become apparent much later than jordan but so his elder brother my elder brother david uh started having nosebleeds uh and where we lived in northern quebec nobody nobody could diagnose it so now it's actually amazing doctors even know to spot the crystals in the eyes um but uh, we were fortunate we have doctors in the family and uh he was taken david was taken quickly to mcgill uh the research facility in montreal where we were exposed to leading world leading doctors and they diagnosed cystinosis so if it had been 1964 they both have died before the 70s because uh uh, forget the cystinosis, the cure and the cure, the palliative in those days was, was a kidney transplant and kidney transplants were very new. And even getting to the diagnosis of what was wrong, there was very few dialysis units. So, uh, before say 69 or so, I'm pretty sure most cystinosis cases died, died of renal failure, um, in childhood. So, uh, Pete was leading edge on a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, later on, he, he went through the kidney transplants twice, actually. Um, and the wonderful thing about Jordan's story is uh, cystinosis doesn't kill people, renal failure does. And transplants are amazing, but it's not a happily ever after story. It is uh, 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 handfuls of drugs every day, immunosuppressants that uh, make you susceptible to everything from diabetes to cancer to disease other rare diseases nobody's ever heard of um so it's wonderful pete was met the medical establishment in those days gave him uh 30 super high quality years and a lot of good years and uh, uh you know if it was the 1800s he lived a normal lifespan and 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 was able to travel and see the world and become a lawyer and uh, have a great life so uh, uh i'm amazed how far things have come and Jordan, fantastic. <laughs> uh, avoiding a transplant uh, four months out of your life, good trade. Well done. It's, uh, Excellent. So thank you. And you can see, um, as you say, you know, the tremendous progress that's been made. And I think that was one of the things that uh, when we received the notice of the legacy from Pete, he really wanted to be able to contribute back in terms of uh, medical research and medical progress and also the support. So, you know, we've kind of come full circle here. So really please 
as I said, we're, you know, so happy to be able to set up the foundation, you know, thanks to the legacy that left, which leads us to Adichie, and you actually have a better connection than we thought, because um, certainly, you know, Pete and the uh, transplant uh, at McGill, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing at McGill. Sure. Um, so I'm in my last year of medical school right now. And uh, the hope is that I can specialize in genetics. Um, so I, when I think about rare and what it means to me, I feel like a rare found me when I was 10 years old. And believe it or not, I was watching a news program um, at that time that featured a little boy with uh, a brittle bone condition. And so that always, I don't know what it was about that story, but it's led me to, you know, different opportunities, uh, like a student, a researcher, an advocate. Um, one of my closest friends uh, is affected by a rare disease now. So, I mean, it's had a tremendous impact on me because of the experiences that I've had. Um, because of this, and I, I always feel like I'm sort of, I don't know, being pulled back into this space <laughs> somehow. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what the word for that is, but. <laughs> no, it really is a calling, I think you've got out there. And I think the ability, as you say, to take something that you feel such a passion for from the age of 10 and to make it into an actual vocation is something that not everybody gets a chance to do. So, you know, who knows, right? So I'd like to introduce you to the project that Adichie brought to us uh, uh, you know, a year and a half or so ago. Tell us about this. This is the zebra alphabet. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it, because I've got a copy of it here, and I'm going to actually yeah. show you a bit about what's inside of it. So what is this, and why so, did you think it was important to write this? I thought it was important to write this. Well, when we met in India that year, I was studying um, rare genetic conditions, and I think learning about, so there's 7,000 rare genetic conditions. And I thought like, what did I really do this year other than be moved by people, did a study, but like, I just felt like that wasn't enough um, because I'm only one person. It would be a miracle probably if I could find a cure for one condition, uh, if not more in my lifetime. So I thought we needed a way to have more people involved in this conversation. And the, I think the, what I was finding was that rare conditions were not given the attention that it, sort of they needed. And what I wanted to do is make it relatable. Um, and so I tried to combine this concept of rare conditions to something, attach it to the alphabet. It's a concept kind of that's universal and that everybody sort of in the world knows. <laughs> Um, and learning their alphabets and sort of a fun way to just educate people about something that they don't know and um, tying it to like a universal concept to make it more relatable. It certainly is a very positive book. And you know, you consider, you know, having a rare you know, condition, right? You look at it and it's like, wow, it presents us in such a powerful light, you know? I was, yeah. you know even the, um, the little uh, uh, text that you've got on it, right? It's just amazing because, you know, door syndrome is the reason that my fingers are so small. And just like yours, one thing they can do is knock on a door or a wall. It's, you know, it just brings everybody together, right? It's delightful. Mm -hmm. So Aditi uh, wrote to me and said, here I am where I hope to be, you know, uh, studying uh, in, in medical school here. I've got this book and I'd like to kind of figure a way of donating it, make a contribution with it. And so we kind of sat around with it for about a year or so. And uh, now with this uh, the, a legacy from Pete, we thought what we could do is, um, as we say, start a fundraising campaign, get contributions to the foundation. Um, one of the concepts we've had way back when I was doing hemophilia is to use the book to raise funds, ask people to donate. And then what we could what do is actually print the book and donate it to children in hospitals and certainly children with rare diseases. Um, you know, it's a very, you know, it obviously, it, be a great just as a, a you know, a, a, you know, a, um, a book that one can display in one's home as well, because it's so beautifully done. 
but you know, also for, for children as well. So we haven't really figured out the details of uh, how we're going to do this, but I was so thrilled when I raised it to a deacon. She says, absolutely, we'd be thrilled you know, to be able to use the book and to be able to make that happen. So really, I think this is such an amazing opportunity for us in bringing everybody together. And we're just about you know at that 15 minute part. So um, you know, I really uh, just want to wrap up and maybe just ask each one of you, um, you know, what do you, what you know, what word would you like to what what would you what what would you like to say to people in terms of why awareness around rare diseases is so important, and well, you know, what do you hope that people, you know, not necessarily those that are affected with rare diseases, but could be, what what do you hope people would get out of uh, increased awareness of rare diseases and maybe i'll start with you Tori. you know you've come forward you've been an ambassador for us you've spoken you know in different kind of settings and you've set yourself out as being a spokesperson for rare disease what do you hope you know uh, your message what, what would your message be and what do you hope that would what impact that would have well <clears throat> when i did this trial there was hundreds of families from all over the world contacting me and um saying that they were so proud of me, like cystinosis families from Brazil and stuff. And I was talking to them and some of them don't even have pills, like let alone I'm getting a treatment to be cured. So I just hope that there's more awareness, not only for Canada and the US, but around the world for people that have this disease. And I hope that they can at least get pills and one day hopefully be cured. So wonderful. So to be able to be that example and to offer people some hope in terms of what, um, what, what may be available elsewhere. Yeah, That's a great message. Rick, what do you think um, you would say? What do you think your brother would say if he were to hear Jordan's story? And uh, and, well, and the, hopefully we could use in terms of his legacy. Uh, Pete would be thrilled to hear Jordan's story. <laughs> 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 um, I, I do know what his friends, his, his donation was not to help cystinosis. He, he, he was a sufferer of a rare disease. So having lived with it for so long, uh, he, he understood the problem when you meet a doctor and quite frankly, they had no idea what you have. They don't know about the eyes, uh, the crystals in the eyes. It's one in 200,000 people. So they can go through an entire life and not meet a case. So, uh, education's important. Uh, when you're diagnosed, uh, we're from, he was diagnosed well before the internet. So there was no Google search to find out what this means, but for the family, um, the, the level of hopelessness and the lack of information is, is profound. So um pete pete's hope was that it would go to education and awareness um you know i'm willing to bet the families that are contacting jordan are still wealthy no matter where they're coming from the less fortunate of the world it might be decades before they find out there's actually hope uh, so it, it's it's it, it's unrealistic to think somebody will pour millions of dollars into researching a disease that afflicts 10,000 people in the world but the education uh information available to families um, sharing of data amongst doctors would be huge. Um, uh, Pete, Pete lived probably the longest with cystinosis, and I wasn't going to say this until I found out uh, that Jordan seems to be cured, but later on, um, the crystals in the eyes cause blindness, um, and Pete knew that because he lived long enough to discover that. So uh, for him, the cystagon and the cystamine were important to him because it was staving off the blindness for him. But, uh, uh, it would be better if you don't need those drugs and certainly you don't need a kidney transplant. Uh, so that's our experience with cystinosis, but I can tell you that Pete, it wasn't cystinosis, it was rare diseases and information is probably the greatest thing you can do. Uh, and we are thrilled to be the beneficiary and we hope that we will be able to really do exactly what Pete wanted. And Aditi, what are you hoping that um, at the end of the day, not just the book, but your own work as a geneticist, what do you, what do you want to leave as a message for people? Yeah, I think just sort of um, taking what Jordan and Rick said about, you know, how Jordan was saying how families contacted him to find out more information um, because, you know, it's a small space, they feel isolated and it can have a tremendous impact. So I guess the word that I'd pick is connection. I hope the book builds connection and community. And, you know, we're all really part of a global community. We all have genes and that's where it all starts. So even if you don't have a rare condition, um, it's still, I think, important to think about these things and uh, ultimately share our experiences. Brilliant. And certainly genetics is where everything is going in terms of that next generation of treatment. So 
hugely mm -hmm. important the field that you're going into and the contribution that you make. And as I say, you're all connected, even though you didn't realize it, maybe when you came in, it's amazing. We look forward to being able to connect with all of you again, and really thank you. We'll do a formal announcement of the foundation and certainly the fundraising campaign. And I guess I'm looking forward to Jordan. Maybe you can be one of our ambassadors. How do you feel about trucking uh, uh, alphabet books around and, and, and selling books? I don't think you have to go door to door, but we would love to make you an ambassador for our uh, fundraising campaign as well. That would definitely be cool. I'd definitely be interested. Excellent. So thank you folks very, very much. This has been so amazing in terms of uh, your stories and what you're contributing. It really is a celebration. Rare diseases has a lot to celebrate. Rare diseases has a lot to celebrate in Canada. We have so many other things that we need to do in order to go that next step, but you're the kind of people that make it um, so worthwhile and are making those big contributions. So thank you so very much for sharing your stories, sharing that hope, and for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. So that's it for, for CORD's uh, Rare Disease Day webinar and celebration, uh, but it's not just happening here. I, I wanna take the chance to, to thank everyone who contributed. I know we, we went a little bit over time today with some technical issues, but to be honest, uh, a, a huge thanks has to be brought out to, um, to Angela and Hillary and, and Durhan and the whole CORD team that worked so hard to, to organize these things and, and bring them to you. And, uh, and thank you for the um, uh, everyone who who participated. Uh, and I love the chat group. Let's keep it up. This is not a um, a one and done. Uh, as you know, uh, Cord has um, a big conference coming up on on March 9th and 10th. So keep an eye out and on uh, Cord's mailing list for uh, for participating there. Um, and let's just uh, keep this going. What an inspiring uh, a panel. Uh, this last one was amazing. Uh, from a member of parliament Dwayne to, uh, to, to patients. And um, yes, we will find uh, more information on, on the book and how to support it. Um, you saw Durhan uh, recruiting. So the more of you who get involved and get to know CORD, et cetera, um, the community's growing. So thank you. And uh, from Colombia, we had people logging in. We had people from, uh, from, from Europe, but most importantly, people in, from Canada, from coast to coast. Du Québec jusqu'au Colombie Britannique. Like, thank you so much for being here. Um, happy Rare Disease Day, everybody. Take care and be well. <laughs>